political and cultural time of day. It is also a compass that people use to find themselves on the map of human geography. History tells of people where they have been and what they have been, where they are and what they are. Most important, history tells a people where they still must go and what they still must be. Born poor on New Year's Day 1915, the late master teacher Dr. John Henry Clark would leave behind a wealth of knowledge. During his childhood, a white lawyer he worked for told him, Sorry John, you come from a people who have no history. Always a voracious reader, young John's thirst for knowledge of the African origins of humanity soon proved his employer's worldview wrong. In a great and mighty walk, he recalls encountering the essay, The Negro Digs Up His Past. On this, Dr. Clark states, for the first time I knew I came from a very old people, older than slavery, older than oppression, older than Europe. The quest was on, and for the next several decades, John's search would continue over and over to prove the dominant worldview wrong. His work bore much fruit, culminating in over 40 historical and literary documents being involved in and creating several organizations and taking a part in the black liberation movement. His three most well-known works are the short story turned short film, The Boy Who Painted Christ Black, as well as two illuminating studies on Malcolm X and Nat Turner, enlightening works that strip away the mainstream characterizations of these two as hate mongers. Dr. Clark taught in many classrooms around the world, his most memorable classes being taught at Cornell and Hunter College. He also made several trips to the African continent, as well as living there and working under Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, who led Ghana to freedom from Great Britain. A true self-made man, his middle name Henrik was changed from Henry as a nod to renegade playwright Henrik Ibsen. May Dr. Clark's work continue to live on. Many times, history is his story, leaving out the important contributions from the other half of the human population, the woman. Here's someone who reps her story well. Activist, writer, institution builder, self-taught, fluent, four-language speaker, and historian, Drusilla Dungy Houston. She was born in Harpers Ferry, West Virginia in 1876, 17 years after revolutionary abolitionist John Brown stormed the armory there. Her writing career began with the Oklahoma Black Dispatch, a prestigious national newspaper of the day. Drusilla worked on the paper with her brother Roscoe, helping keep it afloat as well as writing pieces on history and social issues. The year 1926 would see the release of her multi-volume magnum opus, Wonderful Ethiopians of the Ancient Kushite Empire, Book One. Nations of the Kushite Empire, Marvelous Facts from Authentic Records. The Association of Black Women Historians states Drusilla was most likely the first and only black woman to assert a pan-African origin of civilization and culture, a mindset that would reappear for the next several decades. Unfortunately, her work faced much racism as well as sexism, even from leading black historians such as W.E.B. Du Bois and Carter G. Woodson who tried to discredit her. Undeterred, Drusilla kept on producing four decades worth of material, including a screenplay titled The Maddened Mob, which was a blow-by-blow -blow answer to D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation. As a teacher, she devoted herself to teaching black children, acres of diamonds as she called them, correct information about their African origins. Drusilla went on to the afterlife on February 11, 1941, after a long bout with tuberculosis. Sadly, only volume two of her 1926 monumental, wonderful Ethiopian series survived. And thanks to Dr. Peggy Brooks Bertram, her work will see the light of day again. July 9th, 1982. Groundbreaking film Tron tells the story of fictional computer whiz Kevin Flynn, who was thrust into an amazing journey on the other side of the screen to gain evidence that his former employer stole his work. A security program named Tron helps him, and Kevin finds fame and fortune. December 1st, 1940, a real-life Kevin Flynn enters the world in Queens, New York. His childhood will be marked by a high aptitude for electronics, resulting in the building of his own radio station as well as repairing TV sets. 
August 1976. After relocating to Silicon Valley, the same pioneer designs, invents, and releases the Fairchild Channel F, the first market-released cartridge-based video game system a year before the Atari 2600. 1977. After building it in his garage, arcades across the country debuted Demolition Derby, one of the first arcade games also built by this pioneer. Now, just who was this real-life Kevin Flynn? Meet Mr. Gerald Lawson. While he was unable to travel inside a computer, Gerald made the impossible possible. A lot of people in the industry swore that a microprocessor couldn't be used in video games, but I knew better. So I accepted the challenge and went out to design one. After years of amazing innovation at Fairchild Semiconductor, he formed his own company, Videosoft, making game cartridges for several popular brands. Years later, Blacks and Gaming honored him during the IGDA conference in March 2011. Sadly, one month later, Gerald passed on, but thanks to the documentary A Great Day in Gaming and the release of six previously unreleased Videosoft games, Jerry's spirit lives on. The next time you pick up that controller, remember the name, Gerald Lawson. Thank you for watching episode one of Critical Eye Sundial, brought to you by City World, from my city to your world. Viewers are encouraged to log on to pvco.com, City World, as well as the following for more information. Oh, yeah.